somebody told me that. Um, <laughs> that was a little bit embarrassing because my brother's here. <laughs> Okay, so, <laughs> so what? You always say I wish my mother was here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Yeah, mother just posts the these things, but it's almost as good. <laughs> so, um, so what I want to do today, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Um, what I want to do today is talk about the future. And in particular, um, so, if I, yes, I am a Jewish mother of everything I do. <laughs> and um, most people enjoy that, some people don't, I have to say. But um, in my four years at the National Science Foundation, um, I was able to, you know, I was at a place where I was seeing, reviewing, hearing people talk about the very best of the ideas that American researchers had about how technology could be used to foster learning. And um, I guess um, it, it, was, it, was really, it was really quite an exciting four years that I had at NSF. Um, and, and this creation of this new program was really quite uh, timely. So imagine, I bought the very first version of the iPad computer right before I went to Washington, D.C. in 2010. We're now on the uh, fourth or the third or the fourth, I can't remember, uh, version of it. And it does all kinds of, all kinds of things. I lied when I had the, um, when I bought, you know, when I had my funds at Georgia Tech pay for it for me. I told them that I needed it because I'm a learning technologies um, researcher and I wanted it to be able to see, you know, how we would use this technology for education. That wasn't why I bought it, okay, why I had to buy it for me. I bought it because I knew I would be traveling on the subway 45 minutes every day and I wanted to be able to read the paper easily. But as soon as I got it in my hands, I said, oh my God, this is so different. You know, you can hold this technology so easily you can take it with you wherever you go, right? You can gather your data, you can analyze your data, you can write notes, you can interact with other people. All these things that you can do with this thing that's big enough to look at, has enough real estate that you can look at several things at the same time, and um, and you carry it around so easily. There's, there's one right there. You carry it around, it's a little thing. You carry it around so easily. So that was brand new, okay? Um, augmented reality was coming into its own over these four years. Um, there were all kinds of other things. MOOCs, of course, came out in those four years. I'm not as excited about MOOCs. But, um, but there were all kinds of things that were happening in technology. And, um, and, one, and what my program was about, it was about um, designing the next genres, the new types of learning technologies. How will we use hardware and software for education in the future? It wasn't about creating the next piece of software to learn about some piece of mathematics. It wasn't about creating the next piece of software to learn um, you know, at some specific some specific things, but it was about telling us about the next kinds of software that we're going to have, the next kinds, it's not all software, the next kinds of hardware software technologies that we're going to have. So here's another example. I have my Fitbit here, right? Um, and I just told that I was sleeping. Okay. <laughs> so, um, there we go. We'll stop. I'm not sleeping. So, so um, one of the proposals that we got early on was for, and I don't have the example of that here, was for somebody who was going to use these, you know, quantified self um, 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 technologies to help kids to keep track of kids' nutrition and um, um, and activity, so that they could then play themselves in computer games that would help them to get an idea of what their nutrition and the kinds of activity, their fitness level, okay, means in terms of the interacting <coughs> in the world, and helping them to set goals for themselves about, um, 
you know, what they want it to be, right, in terms of their fitness, in terms of their health, and help them get into that. That was bef way before this was out on the market, okay? It was two years before this was out on the market. Um, and when we finally gave them the money, you know, it was a year before, I guess. When we finally gave them money, they were just able to go buy these for the kids at almost no cost. You know, where they were, where they had been thinking that they needed to do other things. So there are just so many technologies that came into their own during that time. So, um, so I have become convinced. You know, there are these people who talk about MOOCs as being the next thing. There are people who have talked about tablets as being the next thing. There were people who talked about expert systems as the next thing. There were people who talked about TV as the next thing. You know, it's going to revolutionize education. <laughs> That's not where it's going to be. To me, what's going to revolutionize education is that the hardware, software, technologies that we have are going to allow people, allow learners, to play roles in situations that would not be possible otherwise. To me, that's the big thing. But um, that's my punchline, so I gave it away. But what I want you to do now is to imagine, because I want to talk about the promises of learning technology, I want you to, um, to, to start imagining, okay? And I'm going to show you some examples, some of my favorite examples. Um, so uh, imagine what education could be, okay? So that should be a capital Q in room break. Mm -hmm. I forgot to fix it. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite pieces of technology. This is used by fourth and fifth graders, maybe third graders too. And what they're doing is learning about earthquakes. What, I'll tell you what each one of these things is. It's not really that important that you see the details of it, okay? Um, Tom Moore at University of Illinois in Chicago is the person who's been working on this. And his idea is, he says, what if we could bring, what if we could bring the field into the classroom? What would that make possible? And this is an example of bringing the field into a classroom. What happens is that the classroom is set up as a place where room quakes happen. So a room quake is, um, it's an earthquake. I mean, it's a, like an earthquake. Um, there's speakers in the room, and they start rumbling when there's a room quake. There's a controller, and the controller decides when the room quakes are going to happen. The teacher can set it so that it doesn't go off during a scout test, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but it could go off at lunchtime, and then they come. You know, it happens, and now they got to do the measurements. And whenever a room quake happens, the kids figure out where the epicenter was. It yes. was. Mm -hmm. um, they figure out its intensity. Okay, and um, and they hang <coughs> something from the ceiling saying, here's where the room quake was and here's its intensity. What you see in these pictures are the kids, they're a bunch of seismographs. Seismograms. Size is the graph. Mm -hmm. In the room. The graph is the graph. The gram is the, is the meter. Size, seismometers, that's the meter. Oh, meter. Okay, there are a bunch of seismometers in the room. They're spread out across the room. And um, they go and they look at the seismometers and they look at what they're showing. Okay? They take strings from the seismometers, okay, and they use them to figure out where the epicenter of the earthquake is. Okay? And they do bunches and bunches of computations and they're helped by you know they're helped by there being some calculators special to this to discern to determine what the magnitude of this thing was. <laughs> what happens later on is they're hanging these things from the ceiling at the epicenters of all the of all the room quakes. They figure out where <laughs> the plate boundaries are in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have fourth and fifth graders who are doing science the way scientists do. Okay? Um, the fields in the classroom, they, they're doing field science. Okay? Um, 
notice with their whole bodies involved in it. Okay, we were talking about embodied cognition early on. They're they're really involved in using you know using all of the kinds of tools and instruments that seismologists use. Okay, and doing it the way they do. I mean, look at the way they're huddled around this thing. You know, look at the movement around the classroom in here, right? And you've got the graph <coughs> over there. So imagine if we can bring the field into the classroom. What would that mean about the future of education? Okay, here's another one. Okay, this is um, a, uh, this is an augmented reality um, project. <coughs> And what these guys are trying to do is use augmented reality to make history come alive. And to make history come alive in such a way that the kids can do historical inquiry um, and they can, you know, figure out what happened once upon a time or over time, right, based on um, a set of resources that are available. So this is done by a guy named Doug Goldman, who is a computer <laughs> scientist, and I don't remember Singh's first name. Okay, and somebody else who I didn't list there who is the history education expert. Okay, and what they are doing is um, is they've got in their um, community, they've got this place, this historic place that was really important in the school desegregation um, in the United States. So it used to be that there were separate schools for blacks, for African Americans, and for whites. So African American schools, white schools, at some point, Brown versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court said separate but equal is not okay. They've gotta be integrated with each other. And there were some places where people said, over my dead body, and there I were some deaths, okay? Um, there were some places that people didn't want it. And this particular place, um, Christensen Academy, I think it's called, Christensen Institute, was a place where there were particularly important things that happened over time in, that, in school desegregation. So these guys spend time in the classroom um, learning some things about school desegregation and about this particular place. Okay, and then they go out to the site with the augmented reality. And um, do I have another picture there? No, I'm sorry. They go out to the site with their augmented reality. Oh, what's <coughs> augmented reality? Maybe some of you don't know. Augmented reality basically has to do with layering, um, putting layers on top of the real world using technology. So you might layer um, force vectors and um, acceleration vectors um, and velocity vectors over something as it's moving down the street, okay? So that somebody could actually see, you, you could have the, the you, could, you could have the, the, the quantities on there too. So somebody can, you see something besides what's there. You could label buildings, you know, hold up your, hold up your phone, hold up your tablet right, at, to a spot, okay, and see the buildings labeled in it. That's augmented reality. You're la putting layers on top of the real world through technology. What these guys are doing is they're creating the software where you're holding this up, you're going and visiting the Christian Cynic Institute, and holding up your, your, um, your mobile technology, okay, in order to setting it up in order to say what layer do I want to see. So everybody's got, or groups of kids have different questions they're trying to answer, okay, and they might hold it up and say, I want to see what was happening in 1980, you know, September 1982, right? Um, and they hold it up to a classroom and they see what's happening in the classroom. They hold it up to the lunchroom. They see what's happening in the lunchroom. They walk around the school, they hold it up, they collect their data. Now what these guys did to turn the virtual, the, I'm sorry, the augmented reality by itself, however, is not a learning technology, right? It becomes a learning technology 
when you integrate it with the other technologies, the other functions that are needed, so that somebody can not just see what was going on, but they can also interpret what was going on, take notes about what was going on, you know, do the things that they need to do, okay, to be able to, 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 to do this interpretation that you want, to collect the data and do the historical inquiry and to learn from it. So the augmented reality is augmented with note-taking capabilities um, that are attached to the place and the time where the note was taken, okay? Um, they're augmented with, uh, it's augmented with, uh, I don't know, some other things as well, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, and, um, and they also have, they also have several kinds of resources that they can look at as they're going along. If they say, well, gee, you know, they see this person there, in there, and they say, I want to know more about this person, I want to know more about this incident, they go down and they can read about it, they can take notes about that as well. Okay, so they go back to their classroom, then they take all their notes, okay, in the best of all worlds with this, they go back in their classroom and they'd be able to see the virtual Christensen Academy with the overlays and all the notes that they took. Uh, it, it's not in that place, space yet. On a big screen that they could, that the pe all the people in the group can stand around together as they make sense of things. Okay, so imagine, okay, being able to take advantage of the historical locations around where your school is, okay, <laughs> to learn real history and do real history the way that historians do. Okay, um, very exciting to me. Okay, here's a picture of another one. This is called EcoMove. Um, EcoMove is done by Chris Didi and his students at Harvard. Um, and um, in EcoMove, we've got a virtual, uh, a virtual environment around the pond. It's an actual pond that's close to Harvard. Okay, and um, what you get to do as a learner is you get to walk around the pond area. Here's, a, here's an area of the watershed that goes into the pond. You get to walk around the pond area. You get to, um, to go down in the water, either in a submarine or you can just walk in, it turns out. You get magnifiers. You get periscopes. Um, you have um, equipment for um, for taking measurements, these were this is all equipment for taking measurements here. Okay, you can look up things about particular fish or plant life that you see. Okay, you've got somebody to give advice. Say this measurement seems low, maybe you should try it again. Um, not quite Mildred the cow, but you know. Um, <laughs> so wasn't that Mildred, wasn't that the cow's name? In <laughs> So, so what the kids do in this one is that they're put in the role of having to figure out um, why the fish are dying. And you got kids who want to figure out why the fish are dying, and they really get to be immersed, you know, in this environment to figure it out the way that an environmental scientist would be immersed in the environment. Is it very different from what's the uh, such a class? Uh, he says it's not real different. I knew about this, so I'm not so He says it's not really different. I think they're working I, I, I don't know. Um, another example, here we've got something that's also place-based, just like the, uh, well, actually, what I should say about place-based, there's another version of this. Okay, anybody can use this anywhere. But suppose that you had an authoring system in which you could, it was easy for you to take some location close to you Okay, and put it into a system like this so that somebody could walk around the location that's close by. They could examine their own pond. You wouldn't have to change a lot of the resources that are in there, right? Um, and, uh, and you could still, you know, you could be doing the same thing in a place that's close to home. Um, he also, Dee Dee also has another version of this that's a, um, that's a augmented reality. Okay, where you actually go into the pond with your, with your mobile device, okay, and you're taking measurements, but you also have the overlays, right? So you can, you know, take a, take a picture of something and say, 
well, what kind of fish is this? And look it up, okay? Or you can, um, um, you know, have things pointed out in it. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what's in there. So you can start getting to doing things actually in your own environment. Um, weather blur is another one of these. Maybe I should skip this one. Uh, I'll, I'll go through it really quickly. And this one, which is going on in Maine and in Alaska, they're trying to understand how to use the internet to connect kids in the classroom, okay, with um, the fishermen out there in the ocean who are trying to catch their catch, okay? Now, it's important that this is Maine and Alaska. In rural Maine and rural Alaska, coastal rural Maine, coastal rural Alaska, you have these two-room schools. I mean, really, you have a bunch of these two-room schools, okay? And you've got the, most of the people in the town, they are fishermen. I mean, the men in the town are fishermen. I don't know what women do, and I'm sure there are some women fishermen too, but fisherwomen, it doesn't sound right. Um, so, um, so the fishermen know, they see that climate, the weather's been changing. They, they know there's climate change, right? They see the weather changing, things are different. They need explanations for that. They need to figure out what to do in terms of, of catching, catching their fish. Um, and they're taking a lot of measurements along the way. There are all kinds of things they know to do, but they don't exactly know why they do it. These guys are creating a unit where the fishermen and the kids and the teacher and their parents can get into it and some experts from around the community are all interacting with each other to learn about ecosystems, weather, climate, um, the effects of climate on an ecosystem. Okay, and um, it's mostly about connecting people by internet and writing the curriculum. It's mostly about people wanting to be involved. We talked about culture <laughs> earlier and identity earlier today. Okay? It's large, it's very much about people wanting to be involved, doing this kind of thing in such a way that the community wants to be involved in it. It's very, I love it. Okay, but so imagine being able to do this kind of thing in a mill town, okay, in a place that makes ceramics and whatever it is, you find the piece of the science curriculum or the math curriculum or whatever it is, okay, where you can connect the people this way, okay, you, you, get, you get people looking at education, you know, involved in education who never thought about education before. You could get some real culture shifts happening in addition to making it, you know, useful and fun for the kids. Um, what I was going to do at this point was to show you, I don't know what time it is, it's late. Um, I wanted to show you something that was, um, that wasn't what I wanted, that was what I wanted. I wanted to show you something that, that I've done, okay, that's also about making science. Having, putting kids in the role of being able to, to, to be the kinds of professionals who would solve the kinds of problems that they're asked to solve. Um, I have a three-year curriculum, it's called Project-Based Inquiry Science. Um, it's uh, made up of 13 project units. Each one of them has either a big challenge or a big question that kids are addressing. And they're in the role of scientists or engineers as they're doing that. So in Animals in Action, um, they, what they are doing, they're answering a big question, how do scientists work together to solve problems? But really the interesting thing here is that, and that they get into, is that they're designing, um, they're designing uh, zoo habitats for animals <laughs> that allow those animals to either communicate or feed the way they would in the wild and do it in such a way that people can see it. A lot of times the way people can see it means putting cameras in the right places. It's not, that's not a big deal in it. But, so what they do is they design an animal enclosure that allows, I, I already said that, and in order to be able to do this, they have to be able to observe and interpret what the animals are doing, understand how they're feeding, understand how they're communicating. Um, 
Right now, what they're doing without tech, without fancy technology, what I should say, is that they watch videos. Okay, so their favorite one is of a lion um, attacking a little beast. Okay, and um, I don't know how you say little beast in, in, in Hebrew. Lion is Ari. <laughs> so it's a lion, it's a big animal, it's a lion attacking a big animal. So, um, so they have to be able, they have to be able to look at it, you know, see what's going on and interpret what's going on to do that. How do we help them do that? And how does this unit help them do that? Well, they start out by watching a small group in the class interact as they're eating cookies or crackers or something. And everybody in the class has to describe it. And guess what? Everybody's descriptions are different. Um, and as they describe what's going on, they say, wait a minute, you can't do science if everybody's descriptions are different. And they talk about, you know, what are we going to do so that we can describe this better? And they come up with ways of describing. <laughs> and then what happens is that they go back and they do it again. And they're just watching people again. And this time, what happens is that they've got <laughs> a lot of interpreted behavior in their observations. You know, this person was mad. This person was hungry. Okay, that's, that's interpreted. All they know by watching is that this person picked up the Oreo cookie and put it in their mouth and took a small bite, and that person picked it up and took a big bite. You know, that's, that's, that's all they can see. So they get to start talking about observations and interpretations and keeping them separate from each other. They're learning how to be ethologists. It's people who know how to interpret, watch and interpret what animals are doing. And they're doing that all the way through the unit, getting better and better at that as they go along, and finally designing this enclosure. There's the only technology in this is those videos that I told you. No technology, but 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 they're but they're real scientists, right? Um, in genetics, they're um, how can knowledge of genetics help feed the world? I don't know what that big question is there. This is this is my that this is the publisher's website. What they're doing is designing a new breed of rice that um, can uh, grow with less water. It's actually for the Philippines. Can grow with less water and is, has more nutrition than what they've had. Um, and they go through Mendel's experiments and they, um, they learn about monocultures and Multicultures, well, it's not multicultures, whatever it is. Um, they learn about they learn about breeding, okay, um, and they learn about genetic engineering as they go along. They build these little um, animals out of um, marshmallows, out of candy. Um, they each of those animals has eight genes, or each on a se separate chromosome. The teacher builds two of them makes a bunch of uh, chromosomes for everybody to pull out of a bag. Everybody pulls the chromosomes out of the bag. They make their own one of these little things with the candy. And they get to see family resemblance. They get to see 30 children of the mommy and daddy <laughs> one thing. Okay. Um, there's all kinds of genetics. They understand all of that. Okay. And they do some things with uh, when it gets to, to uh, doing the, the um, genetic engineering, they're doing stuff with uh, amino acids and I, it, just matching things together on pieces of paper. There's, there's no technology in here, okay? No technology in here now. But, and I would still have them build the marshmallow kids, okay? The marshmallow babies and see family resemblance. But if we had technology, right, they could do, they maybe could use something like Genscope, okay, to do it again and do it again and do it again, right? And start to look at the things that stay the same and the things that are different. If they have technology, um, they could actually do the genetic engineering. Of course, if they could do the, I mean, do it in virtually. Of course, if they can do the genetic engineering, they might not be ready to argue about it as, as much, but, but whatever. Um, they argue about the safety of genetic engineering in this, in this, in this unit as well. So there are a bunch of, uh, they're, 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 what did I say, 13 units. This one's about um, cells and about 
viruses and about bacteria and body systems and this one's about ecosystems and this one's about erosion and um, uh, it, it's about surface uh, things that happen on earth and then there's astronomy and that one's about volcanoes and earthquakes and um, this one's about weather and you know so it's, uh, this is the chemistry unit it's about air quality and there's an energy unit one where they're moving big things this one's about forces and I think that's all of them so um, the point is okay that what you see here is um, what you saw there is a whole curriculum over time where kids are playing the roles of scientists and engineers over a three-year period in science class now, in all of these different things, learners are immersed in role play for the purposes of addressing missions or challenges connected to the real world. Technology allows them to play the roles that professionals <coughs> would play. And they have resources available to do the things, you know, the same kinds of resources professionals have when they're working on similar projects. For record keeping, for data collection, for looking things up, sharing exploration, trying things out, making sense. They have the support they need for their project work and for le learning. Um, and class time is spent on two things, playing their roles to achieve their goals and making sense of all of it, right? Um, and if you can configure classrooms this way, okay, then there are possibilities of the kids not only being able to pass tests about content, right, but also learning the practices of different disciplines, um, learning problem solving, communication, collaboration pra practices, and actually helping them understand who they are, real identity, work, and confidence building. And I'm not going to say more about that. Um, in each one of these, the technology offers different functions. And I'm going to claim, OK, later on, that in fact, it's not enough yet. But, but imagine if you could do these things. So I see these as exemplary of the future, and there are two reasons, okay? Because there are two <laughs> things that are really important in fostering learning. One of them is, um, the second one of these, one of them is promoting and sustaining motivation and active engagement. It takes a long, that's the first one, it takes a <laughs> long time to develop deep understanding and masterful capabilities. It's an incremental process. We know it's a set of incremental processes. We know it takes sustained and long-term effort and requires a lot of help. How do you get learners to pay attention, to actively engage over long periods of time? That's 50 to 80% of it, keeping them engaged. Okay, Having them really want to engage. Uh, the rest of it is all the reflection on it, right? Being able to have the experiences and doing the reflection on it. So um, I made up the 50 to 80 percent, okay? <laughs> I made that up. But, but I like to see these as being exemplary. Now, you know, the issue is, you know, how do we promote and sustain this engagement? And I think the, an I think the answer, I, one answer I want to give is role play. But I, but I actually want to, um, to, I should say authentic role play, but I actually want to focus more on this first thing, right? This mental model building, the, 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 the getting to deep understanding of masterful <laughs> capabilities and that incremental way of doing that. And there's some things that we know about to how to do that, and I want to show you some additional technology, some things that we know about that. So I talked earlier in, what I, in, in the seminar I was in about embodied cognition and how technology allows us to take advantage of the things we know about that to help people learn. So embodied cognition means that we're not just assuming that all learning, all thinking is in the head. Okay, what we're saying is that bodies play a big role in what we can learn and in how we learn. When George Lakoff was first talking about this stuff like 30 years ago, we all thought he was totally crazy. We thought, why do we talk about the stock market rising? Well, we grow up over time, right? So up, the stock market is it's getting bigger the same way we grow up, right? So, um, so here's an example. I mentioned this earlier in, in the seminar I was in. 
we've got um, uh, Kylie Kepler, Joshua Danish, and all any of you are working on these things. Um, and okay, are working on these things. And um, um, here you see this example. Okay, that we've got kids. Ah, oh, you can't see it, and I have such a good picture of it. In this. Okay, we have kids who have bee puppets on their hands. And these bee puppets, okay, have um, have uh, sensors and they have displays in them, okay, and um, um, and the hive. This is the beehive. Has it has sensors and it has displays in it. The kids actually work together as bees. Okay, you have seven or eight kids at a time who have these puppets and they go around the classroom and they're collecting pollen from the flowers and they're taking it back to the hive, okay? And when they collect the pollen, they see their displays show that the amount of nectar that they're, nectar, they collect the nectar. That, and the amount of nectar that they have goes up and when they go to the hive and they put it into the hive, the amount of nectar in the hive goes up and the amount of nectar in their, um, in their bee goes down. Okay, I don't know if they get to see how much is in each flower, but they go around to the flowers and, and, and some of the flowers are, some of the flowers have nectar in them, some of them don't. Okay, um, they ask the question, you know, how could, it would, it, this is first and second graders. You know, it would be so much more efficient, they say in first and second grade language, Okay, it would be so much better if we knew which flowers to go to. And that's a time when the teacher can help them learn about bee dance. Okay, and they can discuss how would you communicate this. And they can come up with ways of communicating and go around and collect nectar again. Okay, um, so their bodies are part of what they're doing. Um, hold on, I want to show you another example. Um, this is an example of something really similar where the kids, oh, that's so bad, I'm sorry. Okay, I have to tell you what it is. Okay, we'll have to turn it back on when I yeah, finish with this. I don't want them to fall asleep. So what you see here, okay, what you see here is a class that classroom that's engineered with um, connects cameras. These are these cameras that can can uh, uh, track motion. So it's got motion tracking cameras, very inexpensive. Okay, I think that this is one of them. Okay, and um, it can track these, what is it, six kids moving around over here. And what the kids see over here, okay, is they see their movements, mm -hmm. but instead of seeing themselves, they see molecules, mm -hmm. okay? And in a more recent version of this, okay, they not only see molecules, but they see the forces between the molecules, okay? Mm -hmm. So that they can see stronger forces when they're, you know, standing very close to each other and just jiggling like that, okay? And, and see the molecule, the, see less forces and force and see the things pulling apart as they move away from each other. So here they're gas, they're playing the role of the gas and they're watching the molecules up here. Okay, and in, um, let's see. Oh, okay. And in this one, they're very close together. You see they're very close together, okay? And um, they seem to just be standing still, but maybe just got them that way. They, they, they're, they're still moving, okay? Um, and they see the molecules up here, and if it was the more recent version of it, they'd see the forces between the molecules, the connections between them, and, they, and they'd see that, you know, solid is, is different. Do you need to look back? I'm gonna show one more. Um, where is it? And, uh, no, I guess I'm not gonna show one more. Okay. Um, no, I'm not gonna show one more. So, thank you. So, um, so what you have here is ways of using motion capture and using just 
know, these new kinds of, of electronics, right, um, to, um, to, to help kids, you know, be able to do the things that they need to do, to see multiple, to see multiple representations, to experience, not just see, to experience multiple representations and how they change with each other, okay? Um, and and uh, build their mental models from that. I'm not going to tell you about geo games. Um, I'm not going to tell you about. Uh, maybe I should tell you about geo games. So in geo games, um, I have to get out of this again and go back to um, to here. What you see here is a screen. I, I'm, I'm, it's not as important that you see this well. What you see here is a um, is a picture of a town, a farming community in India. Okay, and what you see over here are uh, various things you can buy and plant. Okay, and uh, you see some things here about that describe this. What happens in geo games is that uh, this, these are people at Ohio State is that they're designing representations that make it easy for, at this point they're working with college kids, but I think it's going to be high school kids soon, um, that make it easy for students to look at geographical information. That would be socioeconomic information as well as um, weather and climate and, and, and uh, products information to see that information easily and to move around from place to place on a map, you know, and access that and see what's different and the same um, across places. They put the kids into a kind of role-playing game situation, okay, and um, where perhaps they have two farmers who have farms next to each other and they have to figure out how to manage the water that's available between them. Okay, and they have all this data around to be able to do it. Or maybe they have the account, but there could be another one where you've got the Farmers Council from this area of India and the Farmers Council from this area of India, and they've got to figure it out on a bigger scale. Or you've got policymakers, and they've got to be able to inform the policymakers, and you've got other students playing policymakers who have to listen to the arguments of each side and, and, and figure that out. So, um, um, so they have these undergraduates learning to reason about public policy through these representations and the games that go with it. In fact, the um, interesting thing here is that there's really nice integration of formal and informal activities. So they can be doing a lot of this outside of class, right? They can be doing a lot of this outside of class and be discussing it in class, okay? And they can play these games over and over again. Right, there's something something to that. Um, I'm not going to show you collaborative sketching. Or uh, here's an example. I'm going to show you this. This comes from from my from my past. No, I didn't do this. It, it's artificial intelligence. Here, the um, the issue that these guys are trying to figure out is um, is how can you help people learn to be better arguers, to make better arguments, evidence-based arguments, how can you help people do that um, without it totally overwhelming the teacher? Okay, Because you really want them to be making the arguments and getting feedback and making it better and getting feedback and then going to the next one. I mean, you got to do a lot of that. So what they've done is they've figured out how to use artificial intelligence to do that. And basically, they divide the, in, into, two, into two parts. Okay? One of them is the creation of the argument um, structure. As you might imagine, they divide into two parts. Is the way I should say it. Um, they, there's one piece of what they're doing that has to do with the structure of the argument. And the machine can act to argument planning. And the machine can actually look at that structure and interpret it and come back and give some advice. Okay, um, but but only advice about the structure, not a lot of advice about the content of the argument. But that's what they use the other students for. Okay, so when you hear people talking about MOOCs, 
they talk about, oh no, how are we going to grade the things? We need to use peer grading. And they always, every single time, 100% of the time, forget, okay, that if you, that, that peer grading is not just about getting work done. It's also about peers learning, learning from, from criticizing, right, the stuff that other peers have done. And that, it only works out as a learning activity if you give the right kind of scaffolding to make that happen. So I don't have any pictures here about what the scaffolding is, but basically the peers get involved in it and they are going to critique the content while the um, computer is critiquing the framework. Then they do their writing, and there's a natural language program that can do to critique some of the writing. And again, um, students are doing other critiques, but the AI is, um, is, is guiding those who are doing the critiquing and doing the writing as they're going along. Okay. All right. Oh, and um, this one's very neat. Uh, this one's also, this, this one's about modeling and about kids don't really understand what, they don't really understand what data is. Right? It's really hard to understand what data it is. It's really hard to understand how things work. These guys, uh, this is Michelle Wilkerson Jurd, and I forget the name of the other person, um, working at uh, Tufts. And they have the kids here, there, learning about um, evaporation, I believe. And they have the kids draw their best model of what they think evaporation is about. Okay? Then they have them animate it with stop frame animation, stop motion of animation, okay? And then, once they're happy with that animation that they did, okay, then they have them actually, ma actually make a causal model. And they make the causal model, and then they push a button and they say, play it as a simulation, okay? And they can see, okay, to what extent their model okay, that they created matches what they thought it was going to be. Did they get the model right? So it's a kind of, it's a kind of um, bifocal modeling that's specifically focused on uh, kids, this is like fifth and sixth graders, kids, before they really understand what that is, they have to understand that it's something really in their own lives. Okay, so that's part of mental modeling as well. And my, one last example, my one last example of, um, of technology is that if we're going to have technologies doing all these things, you've got technology helping with arguments and technology helping with modeling and technology helping with seeing inside of something, okay, it, and technology helping, yeah, I already said writing, uh, with writing, you know, if they're all separate pieces of software, they're never going to get used together. Okay, because it's just too hard. Okay, so the real important thing is for us to have the right kinds of platforms, the right kinds of, inf of, of technology infrastructures, so I don't know what you call it, back, uh, backbones, right, that pull these things together. And it's way more than having those technologies just be interoperable. You want the kids to be able to very fluidly move between all the different technologies, get what they need from here as they're doing something here. Um, so my, I have a couple examples here, but I'm only gonna show you one. And um, this is an example of, um, here we go. This is an example from Inquiry Space, which brings together, um, those are the only ones, which brings together modeling, uh, simulation of modeling software with being able to see the actual, uh, in graphics, the actual quantitative parts of it. Um, I don't think you can see it here, but they got the connections to the real world, the sensors and the connections to the real world. Um, over here, they're running this thing under a lot of different circumstances, conditions, and they're collecting all that data. And over here, they're using a piece of software that's helping them to interpret that data and, and, and know what it says. So there, I, the, you know, there's no argumentation in here. This is all just the data-related stuff. But we're going to have to have, we're going to have to have 
the kinds of, te uh, kinds of technology backbones that bring all of that together. Okay, so going back to getting finished up. So the first set of technologies that talks about, okay, illustrated what those holes might look like in the future. Lessons will be de-emphasized de with challenges emphasized instead. Activities will be in the context of challenges. These where kids are taking on roles, playing, taking on missions, roles, and, and playing them out. Lessons will be in the context of activities. Lectures will be for, you know, little things. There'll be lectures, they'll be 10 minutes long, not like what I'm doing now. They'll be ten, they might be like I'm doing now, too. They'll be 10 minutes long, you know, short, impromptu. They could be recorded and available as needed, you know. Um, they could be interactive. Reading as well, you know, it will be when it's needed, at the times it's needed, and only after kids have experienced, learners have experienced something, so they're familiar with the phenomena that they're reading about. Um, Project-based, problem-based, design-based, mission-driven, quest-based, you know, all these things are doing that. But what I'm saying is that technology is going to allow us to do those things in even better ways. But here's what I want to say about that. Um, that whole first set, they showed what holes could be like, but none of them were whole themselves. Most were technology-rich individual units, but they weren't technology-complete, and individual units don't deal with coherence across a curriculum. Okay, now the rest of them, you know, PBIS, the one I showed you, the units that I had worked on, that coherently covers three years of curriculum, but it's technology poor. Okay, and none of these things integrate assessment the way they need to, and I didn't even talk about assessment, right? So I showed you a second set, and it showed you a bunch of nifty, useful technologies. Each provides some functionality that can foster learning, and some of it would not be possible without the computer. Um, but each one provides only pieces. So this all suggests Okay, that learning scientists and learning technologists could have a big impact on the future of education, making it easier to carry out project-based, problem-based, design-based, whatever it is, approaches. Um, affording experiences with phenomena, processes, situations that wouldn't otherwise be possible. We know how to afford collaborative activity, not otherwise easily possible. We can provide infrastructure for disciplinary inquiry, for project work. But in order to do that, we have to make it a goal. We have to make it a goal of what we're doing as learning scientists and learning technologists. And I think that that requires that we work together to create hopes that we, W-H-O-L-E-S, integrating technological functions with each other that afford all this project work and inquiry and collaboration and reflection and that encourage and invite learning from experience pedagogy, integrating that with sets of curriculum units content in ways that provide coherent coverage, allow adaptability for local opportunities and needs, um, that all of that is designed in developmentally appropriate ways, taking into account what we know about learning and about sustaining motivation and engagement, and I didn't talk about assessment again, with appropriate assessment capabilities built into it. Um, but I think, you know, I think that this is the first step. And in fact, some of you, some people have been asking me what I'm going to be doing next. And what I'm going to be doing next is creating um, four to six of these, along with lots and lots and lots of colleagues and people who actually know how to build sustainable technology as well. Okay, I'm going to be doing that, <coughs> putting it in place in a lot of different places. You know, I'm only going to be doing it if I can raise the money to do it, but you know, we're talking like $10 million a year, so I have to raise the money. But I think that this is the kind of stuff that we need to be doing. An example of this would be taking PBIS, that middle school, you know, three years of middle school science, and taking advantage of what technology can provide for learning all of that science really taking advantage of it, okay? It's not going to be something that every school is going to be able to use in three years or five years' time, 
but it would give people imagination about what's possible, okay, and maybe change schools in 10 years or 15 years time. That's the idea there. But I'm also going to complain, complain, going to claim that, <laughs> I'm not going to complain. I'm going to claim that even these complete integrated things that I'm talking about are not enough, okay? Um, because not every learner is interested in the same things, not every learner is capable of the same things. School is not the only place where learning happens. Um, so I think that the best of these will also integrate in school and out of school activities with each other and uh, will address the fact that interests and capabilities of learners are not all the same. Um, the other thing is I don't know how and if disciplines are integrated. I don't, you know, I know how to integrate reading and writing and computation into some of this, but I don't know. I mean, do we, uh, to what extent do we want to integrate um, science and history? I, I, when is possible? I don't know. I don't know those things. Um, so my claim is that except for understanding how to do adaptability, which everybody says we need to do and nobody knows how to do, okay, and there are all these people who are talking about hyper-personalization, and that's not what I'm talking about here, because there's so much social stuff in what I talked about. If you're doing hyper-personalization, you're never going to have that social stuff that's so important. You're going to get rid of, you're going to get rid of all the playfulness from it if you, if you have hyper-personalization. So except for adaptability, and integration of discipline, we know how to do this. And I'm claiming that the issues are will and resources. And, um, and that really that's where we have to, to put a lot of our, we have to put our energies. Um, the funding agencies have to put some, some funding there. Okay? Um, and uh, I don't think I'm going to say any more than that. Okay, I'm talking.